Hello folks. So welcome to yet another session on our NPTEL on nonlinear and adaptive control. I am Srikant Sukumar uh, from Systems and Control IIT Bombay. As always, we look at our inspirational image uh, to motivate us to develop algorithms that will allow us to drive systems such as these on Mars and Moon and other such explorations autonomously. So without delaying any further, we move on to our lecture material. So last time, uh, until last time, we were looking at, uh, I mean, we first looked at completing the proof of uh, the norm requirements for the two norm, which is the Euclidean norm. In the process, we also saw a short little uh, proof of uh, cauchy schwarz inequality uh, which is uh, rather specific to this you know euclidean sort of space yeah so today of course we will look at a little bit more general proof of this okay um, and then we you know looked at the notions of convergence yeah cauchy sequence and yeah, what is this convergence what is cauchy sequence yeah uh, and we also saw some examples of you know Cauchy sequence and convergence being not being really an identical concept per se, but there being you know small differences between the two and uh, the possibility of constructing a, a Cauchy sequence that is in fact not convergent by creating a you know a, a sort of um, weird vector space. Yeah. Now we also spoke about complete non-linear space or Banach spaces until now and uh, the good news was that we uh, all the spaces that were really in consideration uh, that are or that are going to be in consideration in the future in this course are all all going to be Banach spaces yeah so this is definitely something that's um, you know comforting for us that we don't have to actually verify every time whether uh, the spaces we are working with are Banach spaces or not yeah so we don't deal with such very specific very special cases in this course and um, in most applications you would not find such cases all right uh, then we looked at the notion of an inner product space which is slightly more general than a, a non-linear space and we also saw the definitions of you know what is an inner product and uh, we in fact also saw that if you're given an inner product space there is uh, also a corresponding norm which can be defined by uh, defined as uh, the norm of x with x in this capital x uh, being defined as the inner product of x with itself yeah so this is sort of where we were last time um, so i will actually just just start here and call this you know lecture five and so i think let's see i think i did not label this completely uh right because we started somewhere here i would say uh, right so let's not worry so much about these numberings per se but this is sort of where we started the lecture four and so we are at lecture five now right so just like the notion of a, a complete normed linear space there is of course also the equivalent notion of a uh, complete inner product linear space right so when do we say that this uh, space is a hilbert space we call the space a hilbert say space if first of all we have an inner product space that is x with the inner product operation uh, which is complete with the corresponding norm Right? So not with any arbitrary norm. So maybe the inner product space admits a different norm also, but we are not concerned with that. Okay. If the inner product space is such that the associated norm defined as this, yeah, in this associated norm defined in this way, the vector space is complete. That is all Cauchy sequences converge. Then 
the space is called a Hilbert space. Okay, then the space is called a Hilbert space. Again, um, this is not difficult. We will, uh, you know, let's go back again. I mean, if we take our usual uh, Rn, you know, let's see. Uh, if I write an example as our usual Rn with the inner product being defined by, uh, you know, uh, x transpose y x comma y in rn if this is the inner product space we are considering right then and the norm that we get all right so the norm that we get uh in fact let me be very careful i think there's a slight error in how we have done this so this this norm in fact should have a one half okay there should be a one half okay in this definition of the norm there should be a um inner product of x with x to the power half okay so the example that we were giving is that if i have rn with x transpose y that is the usual dot product scalar dot product that we know uh, being the corresponding inner product then if you look at the norm uh, the associated norm it is simply uh, let's see let me write it in this stop product notation it's simply going to be x transpose x to the power half and this is nothing but the two norm of the vector as we have defined until now okay this is exactly the two norm of the vector and we already know that rn with the two norm as you can see from this example rn with the two norm is in fact a complete linear space yeah and therefore rn with the two norm is a complete linear space and hence this inner product space satisfies all the requirements for being a hilbert space okay so again the good news is that most of the space times we work with euclidean spaces that is rn rp rk and so on and in all these cases the vector space uh, the inner product that we consider is the dot product. If we take the dot product as the corresponding inner product, then Rn with this dot product is a Hilbert space. Yeah, and therefore we are able to handle most of the cases that we are going to cover in this course. Okay, so most of the examples that we cover in this course are in fact going to be Hilbert spaces. All right. Okay. So moving forward, yeah. Until now, we did look at the matrix norm, right? So this is the, let me again write this. We already introduced this, but not. Completely. So we are going to try to do a better job of defining and explaining what the terms mean, right? So we defined the induced matrix norm earlier as somehow representing the maximum magnification that a matrix provides to any vector in the vector space. All right. So the induced matrix norm. So I mean, I, I will actually want to write this definition a little bit more general way as this is the soup uh, over all x in a vector space right so we essentially have to have not just a vector space but a non linear vector space right it's not just enough to have a vector space but we also need the norm without which we cannot actually write these quantities all right okay so uh, the important thing to note is that uh, the induced matrix norm is defined as this that is it is the somehow the maximum magnification provide by, provided by the matrix to any vector in the vector space right so uh, although i've written it in this way it's it's um, for the purpose of whatever we are going to do um, it's sufficient for us to have um, x as you know some rn yeah so that's what we are going to assume that x is actually some euclidean space some rn all right so one of the things to remember is of course we are we have to assume that 
it's not the zero vector right because otherwise i have a division by zero and it doesn't make sense anymore right and the other thing is i'm somehow introducing this notation of a supremum a soup right so what is the soup the soup or the supremum is simply the least upper bound okay so the supremum is the purpose of the supremum is to uh, sort of generalize the notion of a maximum okay so the purpose of the supremum is to generalize the notion of a maximum all right so what is uh, the supremum the supremum as we say here is the smallest value y such that for all x in s x is less than or equal to y now suppose i i did not write i remove this from the definition okay suppose i remove this particular uh, qualifi qualifier from the definition that is the smallest value then this is nothing but the definition of an upper bound of any set okay? this should be obvious to you right? however the fact that we have added this qualifier makes it the supreme that is it is the least upper bound it is not any arbitrary upper bound right for example if i took any set you know let's say i took a set of the form uh, i took an open set 0 comma 1 right so what is an upper bound how many upper bounds right i mean one is an upper bound two is an upper bound three is an upper bound so y equal to one two three anything works right anything works however if you are looking at the least upper bound right, this is the only answer that you can actually say is correct is one yeah nothing else works all right you can you can sort of uh, uh, think about this very carefully right so the, you can think about just make a thought experiment suppose i take um, let me call my soup yeah so, so it's this so soup uh, if soup of zero one is equal to say one minus epsilon okay some epsilon positive suppose i took some uh, suppose i claim right that my supremum is in fact one minus epsilon for some positive epsilon now the question is is this even possible right so think about it uh, this quantity one minus epsilon should understand that because this set is an open set zero one is an open set so what does it mean to be an open set it means that any term arbitrarily close to the boundary is also in the set right so it should be obvious to you that uh, it should be obvious to you that you have one minus epsilon plus delta belongs to zero comma one yeah so where some delta positive right uh, right and uh, one minus as long as one minus epsilon plus delta is less than one okay as long as these two conditions are satisfied yeah as long as these two conditions are satisfied such a one minus epsilon plus delta is contained in this set zero one this is by virtue of the fact that this is an open set which means that if any number which is arbitrarily close to one but less than one is contained in this set okay so you can imagine this is always possible to choose i can always choose a delta positive such that one minus epsilon plus delta is less than one right because all you need is that yeah what do i need i just need that uh, this this essentially implies that delta has to be less than epsilon right as long as i choose a delta which is less than epsilon right i'm good now the amazing thing is this one minus epsilon plus delta right uh, right now the funny thing is one minus epsilon plus delta is greater than one minus epsilon okay 
So 1 minus epsilon plus delta is greater than 1 minus epsilon. Now this is a problem because we were claiming that 1 minus, 1 minus epsilon is a supremum, is the supremum, not a, is the supremum. The supremum is unique. Right? Is the supremum. Right? But we just show that it is not possible because there exists a term in the set which is larger than this supposedly claimed supremum. Now, how can something be a supremum when if it is when it is not even an upper bound? Right? So, arguing like this, you can very easily conclude that one is in fact the supremum of the set. Right? So, you can argue that soup of 0, 1 is exactly equal to 1. Okay, so this is something that I hope is clear to you. So this should sort of illustrate to you what is a supremum. Okay, it is not essential that the supremum of a set lie in the set itself. Usually when this happens, we uh, replace the term supremum by the term maximum. Okay, we no longer use supremum, but we use maximum. Okay, so I hope this much is sort of clear to you. Uh, another example to illustrate the idea of a supremum for continuous functions is to look at say a function of the kind fx equals 1 minus e to the power minus x where x is a non-negative real number. Okay. Now how do we compute supremum? Now we have been defining supremum of sets only but it's not very difficult to generalize to functions because what will I do? Supremum is simply the a supreme of the function soup of f is simply soup of image of f. Okay, when I'm looking at supremum of f, I'm just looking at supremum of the image of f. That is, I take all the points, yeah, that are of the form fx. Yeah, that is this is what is called image of f, and I take the supremum of this set supremum of image of f all right now the important thing to see is that uh, the set e right so let me be careful the set e that I, the way i have defined and the way i have defined the set e that is image of f is actually equal to 0 1 which is closed dot 0 and open at 1 what does it mean that is the set contains 0 why does it contain 0 if i plug in for x equal to 0 then f of x is 0 and it goes almost to 1 but never goes to 1 because when does the value of the function become 1 you get the function value at 1 when this is 0 which means x has to go to infinity and infinity is not contained in real numbers. Okay, this is something that all of you should know. If you don't, should remember, right? So that uh, infinity is not part of reals, and therefore you have this implication that one is not part of the set E. Okay, so what is then the soup? Right. So what is then the soup of this? The soup of image of f is actually equal to 1, just like this previous example. Here it was open on both ends. Here it is open on one end and closed on the other. But it doesn't matter. We are looking at the supremum. So only this end matters. All right. So this function actually has a supremum at 1 and this 1 is not in the set E. Okay. So this is important to remember. Okay. So, there are two conditions under which uh, soup becomes max. Yeah. Well, the most general condition is when the supremum is contained in the set itself. Okay. That is, i.e., if a soup of E belongs to E. Okay. Or if you have a set of finite number of elements, yeah. In fact, if a, if the supremum of E is contained in E, and the finite number of 
if if a set has finite number of elements then the soup of e is contained in e therefore this is in fact the most general condition under which the soup is written as a max okay all right when the supremum is contained within the set itself that is soup e belongs to e then and only then you write the supremum as a maximum okay otherwise the notation supremum is used so i really hope you understand what is the meaning of supremum in our context what um, we now need to realize is that finding the supremum here is not too easy right it's not very obvious how i would find the supremum right in fact if you just ask me an ad hoc question as to find a supremum of this kind of a function what i would do is i would the brute force way would be to to uh, a sweep over all sorts of vectors x right and then compute this and keep trying to find the maximum okay this is a rather painstaking process okay However, if you have some knowledge of eigenvalues and you know some smart tricks, you can of course get simple formulae in some cases. Okay, and we will uh, discuss what those cases are very soon. We will discuss those cases soon. All right. Uh, so we are also interested in a few important matrix properties. Uh, most of the time, we will deal with symmetric matrices, symmetric square matrices, especially. I mean, uh, when I say most of the times, most of the times in um, analysis yeah in lyapunov analysis we are dealing with symmetric square matrices and so we are interested in properties of these symmetric square matrices all right uh, so what are these properties the first is that all eigenvalues are real yeah i hope you know this yeah so most of these things you should already have known or seen uh, a matrix a is called positive definite that is a symmetric square matrix a is called positive definite if and only if the corresponding quadratic form is strictly positive for all non-zero vectors alpha right so if i take any non-zero vector alpha in rn yeah i'm already assuming a is in n by n matrix then i compute alpha transpose a alpha it comes out to be positive and this holds for every possible alpha in rn now again this is another condition which is not easy to verify because then I have to actually sweep over all possible values of alpha. Right? Seems ridiculous. So there are simpler and equivalent conditions. First one of them is that all eigenvalues of A are strictly positive. Right? This is where the fact that eigenvalues are real plays a role. Right? If the eigenvalues are not real, I cannot talk about positivity of the eigenvalues. Right? The second is there exists a non-singular Q such that A can be decomposed as QQ transpose. And the third equivalent condition is that every principal minor of A is positive. All right. So these are the three uh, equivalent conditions for this original condition. Right. Finally, there is a very, very nice inequality that we use quite often in all our results, in all our derivations. And that is that the quadratic form alpha transpose a alpha for any symmetric square matrix is lower and upper bounded by by is lower bounded by lambda min a alpha transpose alpha and upper bounded by lambda max a alpha transpose alpha so what is this lambda min and lambda max these are the smallest and the largest eigenvalues of a Right. These are the smallest and the largest eigenvalues of A. I hope these properties are very clear to you. So these are very, very critical properties and we will uh, regularly invoke these, especially this one, especially this one. All right. All right. Then we want to look at some of the uh, simpler to compute induced norms. Right. I'll come to the first one in the end. The first one is the infinity norm and the infinity norm in so notice that if i want to compute any induced norm any particular induced norm say p then i just have to take the p vector norm in all of this that's it 
okay so if i want to if i want to compute the infinity norm then it is simply the maximum absolute rho sum okay so i take the absolute rho sum and whichever is the maximum value that is the infinity norm of the matrix right the second is the a1 norm and that is the maximum absolute column sum so i take the column sum right and then whichever is the largest column sum that is the one norm the two norm yeah the two induced matrix norm is the largest singular value that is it is the largest eigenvalue of a transpose a square rooted okay so these are the three norms so let's look at a quick example right let's look at a quick example right of a matrix and what will be the norm suppose i take a as again in this case the matrix does not have to be a square matrix so i will take a you know, rectangular matrix 2 3 1 1 yeah 0 0 yeah let me make my life a little bit simpler all right so what will be the infinity norm in fact let me put some different sign also right so so that i don't right so what is the infinity norm so i just compute the let me compute the row sums and column sums so this is the row sum the absolute row sum is 5 absolute row sum is 2 absolute row sum is 0 absolute column sum is 3 and absolute column sum is 4 okay so as per our formula the infinity norm of a is what is the largest absolute row sum so that is 5 what is the one now it is the largest absolute columns and that is 4 now what is the 2 now now here i have to do some work i have to compute you know a transpose a right so yeah so let's see i have to compute a transpose a which is 2 minus 3 minus 1 1 0 0 and whatever 2 minus 3 minus 1 1 0 0 right so let me actually get this guy here right so so what is this so this is actually equal to uh this will first of all be a two by two vector so we all have to remember right because it's a two by three times three by two matrix so it will be a two by two matrix i'm sorry so this is uh four plus one five right then you have minus six minus one minus seven then you have minus six minus one minus seven because of symmetry nine and one ten right so this is a transpose a so now i'm not going to do the rest i'm sorry in the interest of time all i have to do is compute the largest eigenvalue of five minus seven minus seven and ten all right so that's what it is all right so what did we talk about today um, we uh, spoke about you know the notion of the hilbert spaces all right then we discussed in a little bit of detail the definition of the induced matrix norm what is the meaning of the supremum right and how to compute the supremum when does the supremum become a maximum so on uh, then we looked a little bit at the relevant matrix properties for symmetric square matrices that interest us and finally we also uh, saw how to compute the induced norm for some special norm for some special cases like the one norm two norm and the infinity norm which is mostly what we'll end up using and finally also we did see how to uh, you know you know I mean, well i mean we have not seen it yet but we do uh, plan to look at the cauchy schwartz inequality uh, and a more general proof of the
Koshi Schwartz inequality. All right. Um, all right, folks. Thank you. That will be all for today.